All right, good evening and thank you all for joining us. We have a wonderful group of participants with us tonight from California to Connecticut and everywhere in between. Um, this is sure to be an interesting and dare I say even provocative conversation and we're so glad you're a part of it. Uh, I'm Isha Butch and in addition to being a mom of two little kiddos who fortunately are still too young to be on social media, so I'm not yet navigating the same kinds of challenges you all are, uh, I work on the education team at Common Sense, uh, helping to develop our and design our award-winning K-12 digital citizenship curriculum. As you may know, Common Sense is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of all kids and families by providing the trustworthy information, education, and independent voice they need to thrive in the 21st century. Especially after the past year, even just the past few weeks, honestly, we think it's more important than ever to empower people to harness the power of technology to develop curious learners, critical thinkers, and engaged citizens. There's this huge potential for technology to help drive social change, but as we've all seen too well, there's a lot of downsides as well. Misinformation and hate speech have run rampant in our news feeds. We'll get into these challenges and others in our conversation tonight. And most importantly, we'll discuss solutions on how we can make technology work better for our kids and our communities. We'll be taking questions via the comments box. So feel free to add any questions at any time through the conversation. Uh, we'll save about 20 minutes to get to them at the end. Uh, and for those of you who post questions during the registration process, we've either worked them into the conversation or we'll ask them towards the end. Also be sure to check out uh, the chat and the comments as the Common Sense team will be uh, providing links to some really valuable resources. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers for today's conversation. First up, uh, Jim Steyer, the CEO and founder of Common Sense and editor of the new book, Which Side of History, which brings together notable journalists, engineers, entrepreneurs, activists, storytellers, business leaders, and scholars to explore the ethics or lack thereof behind big tech and its impact on kids, democracy, and society at large. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, Isha. Also joining us tonight is Cameron Kasky, one of the founders of student-led gun violence prevention advocacy group, Never Again MSD, referring to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school shooting of which he is a survivor. Cam is also one of the contributors to Which Side of History. Welcome, Cam. Thanks for having me. Awesome, cool, well, let's get started. Okay. Uh, Jim, what has brought us to this pivotal moment in our history with technology? Man, it is a seminal moment. So first of all, Isha, thank you so much. I love it. Isha now has two kids. She's surviving COVID with two kids under the age of three. So people in the audience who are parents know what that's like. And someday you will too, Cameron. Anyway, um, we are really at a seminal moment because technology is everywhere in our lives. It affects each and every one of us. It affects our kids even more. You know, Cameron's generation is completely tech savvy and tech enabled. My, our youngest kid is 16, uh, four, and it is, it is during, particularly during a pandemic, the dominant thing in his life. So basically technology's everywhere. And for 20 years or, or more, it's been pretty much the wild, wild west, unregulated. And now finally, I think a lot because of the fact that people like ourselves and everybody here tonight have looked at the impact of technology, both good and not so good on our society, you're gonna see a change phenomenally in the way that the companies are regulated, how they interact with consumers, their attitudes towards kids, um, and the way that society views them. I think the events in the Capitol on, on January 6th just will drive home in an unparalleled way the impact of social media on our democracy and on enabling voices of hate and extremism and a lot of things. And I think the, that will help the average person see that we're at this seminal moment. And, you know, I, you, as you said, each of this book, I hold it up, which side of history that Cameron and all these guys have good pieces on, I think raises the issue that's a way to discuss, think of most of this stuff. It's aimed at the CEOs of the big tech companies, but I think it's a good way for us to think about technology's role in our lives today, which is that basically, which side of history do we want it on? Do we want to be on personally, but do we want technology on in general? because it can be good and not good. And we're gonna talk about both tonight and we're gonna talk about solutions. So I just think all these forces are coming together now to make it incredibly important issue. 
on top of a pandemic where we've all been cooked up and cooped up inside for 10 months in front of a screen. So incredible time to have yeah. this conversation. And I'm so glad to see Cameron here since I've known him since he was 16 or 17 and he continues to be a great leader. So thank you guys for coming. Awesome. Well, Jim, so I guess touching upon your book, it outlines much of the impact of techno technology on our kids and teens, yep. both social, emotional, and cognitive development. Curious, what are what are the most important concerns you have about the technology and like how it has failed our children? I mean, look, we this is the raison d'etre of Common Sense Media since 2003 when we when we opened it, but really since maybe 2007, 2008 when the iPhone came out and Facebook really exploded. And if you look at it, I think it is there are some basic things. One is being in front of a screen like this is not that great a thing. The pandemic has made that unique, in particularly in terms of how we think about kids. But I think you have to think about stuff like just the sheer volume of time you spend in front of a screen as opposed to and your kids being out playing or socializing with their friends or playing with the neighbors or whatever, wherever. Just the sheer volume of screen time now is unbelievable, particularly during the pandemic. I think social and mental health issues now, you see this really during the pandemic. Our good friend Vivek Murthy, who has a fun piece in the book, but he really, he has a great piece on alienation and loneliness in technology in the book. He's the Surgeon General under Biden now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big issue. I think addiction, attention, distraction, can we even pay attention, is a huge deal. And then what is truth? I mean, I thought it was Biden in his say, uh, in his uh, presidential address on, on inaugurate, his inaugural address talked about truth. And that's a really important concept for our society right now. But mm -hmm. Think of how important that is for our kids. So I think there's a host of ways in which this is just an incredible moment for technology and kids and the impact that it's having. Absolutely, yeah, and I'm excited to dive in deeper. Uh, Cam, let's talk about technology from a first person perspective and the role it has played in driving social change. In your essay in Jim's book, you talk about what's great and what's not. Um, and you and your friends leverage the power of technology to collaborate, to build coalitions, to unite and to drive change. How does that represent the power and possibility of technology? Well, it's really about organizing, right? Because before we had before we had social media platforms to do this, and before we had things like Zoom and other, you know, more niche ways to communicate, um, it, people had to organize in person, and people had to, you know, actually come together. And you know, like Jim said, we've had to readjust this year, and we've had to you know find new ways to do it. So digital organizing has become a lot more prominent uh, in 2020, yeah, in 2021 now, and it'll continue to be, but in, in a way that we couldn't have even expected, obviously, in 2018. So in 2018, digital organizing was largely driven by viral posts and viral moments that you would, you know, you, you'd get a lot of people talking about it, we get news coverage sometimes. But now the digital space isn't just for reaching people, it's for culminating. And that is, uh, you know, the, the benefits are clear and the drawbacks are clear. I really thought that the pandemic era was going to be the time that I was going to be able to teach myself to be less reliant on my phone. You know, um, that I, I was in, I was on such a good kick where my screen time was getting so low, all was well, and suddenly the pandemic happens. And I say, you know what, Cameron, you don't have anything to do today. You don't need to be looking at your phone. There's no meeting coming up. There's no class coming up for which you need to be prepared. You don't need to be looking at your schedule or your calendar. You're doing nothing today. Um, but it just <laughs> ramped my screen time up to the point where I would be taking a break from my phone by watching TV and treating it like it wasn't some sort of screen time, you know, using another yeah. screen as my getaway from my screen. So, um, you know, organizing and and engagement in, in terms of, you know, what activism, what, what activists have to do, it, it's going to, it's going to remain rooted in tech as long as all of our lives are rooted in tech. That's just what organizing is. Yeah. Anything to add, Jim? That's really interesting. I mean, here's the deal. So you guys, the audience, you know, Cameron's one of the founders of March for Our Lives, right? So this is like one of the few really, really successful youth-led organizing movements in the last 30 years. And by the way, and I haven't really talked to you that much, Cam, lately, since uh, uh, like over the last six months. It's really interesting because you guys were, after what happened 
at your high school and what you guys did in Parkland. It was so amazing and to watch that. And you effectively used digital media, but you used also people to people grassroots stuff. What was interesting was in 2020 when we were all living with COVID, so we were all locked in, up in front of our screens, the organizing was both in the streets, but you know, if you think about BLM, right? And you think about a lot of the racial justice protests, that was the street, but so was some of the far right stuff too. What do you think about that? Because even though you're right about it being on the screen, right? And so much digital organizing is a new level of sophistication. Look at what the NBA players did around voting and stuff like that. But how much, what happened in 2020? Because you had all that street protest too. How do you see that fitting together? Well, you know, you know, tech overcoming every aspect of our lives played, again, a positive and negative role in all of these events this year. And it's crazy that which side of history was written before the short before the short run of Parlor. You know, Parlor right. would have taken up half the book if um, if it had been written then. So you you know, yeah. you see a lot of crazy things happening with Black Lives Matter protests specifically, uh, you know, digital media ended up putting a lot of people in harm's way because, you know, as people see, seem to be realizing now, our government likes to target organizers, black organizers specifically, that organize these kinds of events. Um, so in Portland, you saw unmarked vehicles throwing organizers in and, and arresting them because they were able to find these people through videos. People would be posting videos from protests that featured organizers and you know, very, very negative forces within our country's justice system were able to find those people and throw them away. They did it with the Black Panthers back in the 80s or 90s, what do I know? I was born in 2000, which is really depressing because now I have this patchy 20 year old beard and making everybody feel old. Um, but, you know, again, it, the flip side of that is pictures and videos of the people storming the Capitol were able to be, you know, were, were able to be a very, very helpful piece to get them punished. And they're being punished. A lot of them, a lot of them are just returning to their daily lives. But, you know, you're seeing what kind of role people just with their phone camera can play. It's getting organizers arrested and it's getting, you know, the violent, horrific people from the Capitol arrested. And it's it's just something that everybody in the organizing world is going to have to get ready for is, you know, uh, anonymity to a certain degree is has been helpful to organizers for both peace and violence. And that's going away really quickly. And And tech is obviously getting involved with that. But I'll tell you what's interesting, Cameron, there's a cut to that. One is there the you're you're right. You're your generation too, and younger people and even up to 30, probably 30 and under now, I would say, are really much more technologically savvy and they're used to video, right? And they're used to video in a different way than older people are. I'm really serious. And one of the things I remember sitting there watching January 6th and thinking, is this gonna have a huge impact, not just on our country, but is it gonna be remembered? Is it gonna be a 9-11 kind of moment, right? And I, and I think it will be, by the way, and I think it will bury Donald Trump historically as a legitimate political figure, by the way, I do. But I think the re part of the reason is because it's on video and it's so visual, just like 9-11 was. Cameron, you're too young to really remember 9-11, but we aren't when it happened. And it's just the serial images over and over in, in your brain and then all the interplay of social media and the fact that so much of this was then created on social media. And it's just a really interesting time. And young people, this, this discussion is about kids and teens and, and technology. And they've been through, you guys have been through so much with the pandemic, in my opinion, being locked up inside so much of the time, trying to race, whether they're your age kids, each of but particularly like teenagers. I have one, it's really hard on kids and teens right now, right? And they're, and by the way, that's why I said earlier, screen time's relaxed, et cetera. But it's gonna change the way we view the world of media, of, of tech in our lives for kids, but for everybody. And so I, that's another reason I think we're at a seminal moment, but it's true politically, because I think this was the first technologically enabled uh, insurrection in the United States. And it's just so interesting how young people will perceive it. Yeah, I, I wanna, I definitely wanna come back to this idea of organizing and the power, uh, but I do also wanna touch upon, Cam, you'd mentioned, you know, the addictive nature and how that has ramped up in the in the pandemic. Uh, I'm just curious, like, why do you think you are addicted to your device? What do you think causes that? 
Well, I mean, you know, it's designed by people whose job it is to find scientific ways to get us addicted to it. Um, you know, there's the there's the easy dopamine or serotonin release. Uh, what do I know? I'm uh, that comes from getting likes on social media. The colors are made for us to you know not want to look away, and that's why people's screen time goes you know, it goes down when they're on black and white mode on their phone. It, th these are products that are designed to get us addicted to them. And, you know, it's very, very hard to look away from them. I, I, I get full on anxiety when I'm away from my phone and I don't, I'm not doing anything important on my phone. You know, I've, I, I got to stay in touch with my buddies, but it's, you know, the, the, it's all a, by design that we're so addicted to these things, be it just, you know, regularly scrolling on our phone or specifically social media, obviously, um, you know, it's a, it's a game and we're being played and I'm certainly losing and my entire generation is losing. I mean, we literally all downloaded Chinese spyware um, <laughs> that everybody has just completely made part of their lives. I mean, you know, people in this country, there was this whole controversy when everybody was talking about how TikTok was Chinese spyware. And I was like, okay, you know, there, something's going to happen with this, right? You know, we're going to do something about this. Nope. You know, we're just going <laughs> to casually have our data stolen from us by, by an app that is quite clearly, you know, uh, be, at least affiliated with a government that has a lot to gain from exploiting our personal materials. So it's like, you know, it, it's, it's a battle that I feel like a lot of people in my generation want to fight, but you know, we don't want it enough to put down Instagram. And I, you know, I'm, I'm just as bad as anybody else here. I'm always looking at social media and there's absolutely nothing to see. Uh, so you know, it, it's. I, I'd like to think that it's largely a cultural issue, but there's so much that you can do, and there's so much common sense. Obviously, does from a legislative standpoint to try and you know create ways that we can be a society that's not so you know de addicted to this kind of thing and is also able to stay safe from it. Whereas again, that it's important that people are doing this work because a lot of people just don't want to. Yeah, I, I, I just to reiterate, you are t absolutely not alone in your feeling and sentiments about, you know, feeling addicted. I think um, somebody who works on our digital citizenship curriculum at Common Sense, like this is definitely something we touch upon. I think what we really what I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about is as we think about, you know, social change and organizing and everything that there is for good, you know, one of the main downsides that Jim, you had mentioned earlier is just the idea of the the amount of misinformation and hate yeah. speech that is rampant online. Yeah. Um, it's dominated the conversation for the last few weeks from QAnon to the false narrative around election fraud. Um, how have, like, have Jim, have platforms gone far enough to stop the proliferation of hate speech and misinformation? Uh, no, but it's been a huge change over the past few weeks alone. That, so it's a really good question. And by the way, I'm glad. Cameron was honest about the screen time stuff because I know how important that is, you guys, and for everybody in the audience. This is the, I just would remind everybody about screen time that how, how much that these times are unique, but remember the lessons. And I think Cameron's right about putting your phone, everybody learning that and reminding your kids to do the same thing. Um, but um, Isha, I think that misinformation has been this huge issue. I think it's a big issue for kids, but I think in our society, what we've really tried to do at Common Sense is expose the fact that the misinformation wouldn't be that powerful unless it was amplified really by the social media platforms. And in the past few weeks, I think again, the events of January 6th had a humongous public impact and, and, and we'll see how much they do on legislatures and people and the politicians in Washington. But I think that what you have seen and we've tried to fight, we have this uh, effort that we do with the Anti-Defamation League and the NAACP and Color of Change called stop hate for profit at Common Sense. And the goal of that is to educate everybody about misinformation, hate speech, uh, racist speech, white supremacy, and also how it's a money-making machine for, it has been for Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and some of the other big platforms. And we've really tried to make that into a bottoms up issue so that the public understands those issues and puts pressure on companies, particularly we've gone after Facebook and Instagram. We did an ad boycott against them. And then over the past few weeks, we really pressured Twitter, YouTube, 
Apple and uh, Google because of Parler being in their stores. We ask them to be much more vigilant in in policing, if you will, their own sites. And in the case of the uh, uh, the incitement in on January 6th, you know, they banned President Trump, which was a huge factor, I think, in this discussion. So whatever your political perspective on it, these are incredible moments around misinformation, disinformation, entering the political mainstream, and also with the platforms being held accountable for it and actually having to change their policies. And that's gonna be a big theme throughout 2021. For, I think everybody in the audience will see this. This issue is not going away. And during the vaccinations, you're gonna have all this misinformation about vaccines. So one of the big issues you're gonna have as we roll out all the COVID-19 vaccination programs, the anti-vaxxer movement is part of the misinformation ecosphere out there. It's a, to me, we've dealt with it politically in California and they are powerful and potent. They were politically in California. so. This is an issue, Isha, that I think everyone's going to go about. And it's a good thing to talk to your kids and teenagers about. I think it's an important issue for young people to understand that it's no longer three uh, broadcast television networks giving your news with Walter Cronkite at night. Most of their kids are getting their news on Snapchat or Instagram or wherever. And, and therefore, the role the platforms play in our democracy and in all of these issues is humongous. And and. Common sense is there as a resource for everybody in the audience on that one and a political force. Thank you, super helpful. Um, Cam, I just wanted to kind of touch base because I know this is something that's been going on in the now, but you and your fellow Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivors have recently been calling for uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor to step down for her comments around the shooting at your high school. And as we think about misinformation and hate speech, I'm just curious, like, how have you responded to some of the things that have been said and circulated about you and gun violence and your cause? And what did she say? Around? What did she say, Cameron? What did she say? Oh, man. She, <laughs> she said it all. She gave us the whole uh, absolutely insane conspiracy theory package. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because what it really does, in my opinion, and I've been saying this since this all came out, is it's just a reflection of what the Republican Party as a whole has become. Because obviously not every member of the Republican Party in office is going to be espousing these views. But they're, they're, the party is only getting by because of people who you know buy into this insanity. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is a great example of that. The only, the, the only power Trump really had towards the end was just this large culty base. And, um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene and her absolutely, you know, nonsensical ramblings, that, um, that's just indicative of the hate and, and that kind of mindset that gives this base their fuel and is what, and is what their political power comes from. Is this, you know, so what Marjorie Taylor Greene was saying, she, um, it, she suggested that Democratic, uh, certain Democratic Congress people should be killed, um, which is hate speech. And that's one of those things that even the most ridiculous, um, you know, people who will oppose any any sort of restrictions on hate speech. Nobody can deny that advocating for people to be killed is hate speech. She also was spreading conspiracy theories denying the Parkland shooting, which <clears throat> is interesting because Jim, you know, we were talking just a couple minutes ago about how video evidence and videos and you know that that part of what what social media can do, um, you know how how that adds so much to the conversation around organizing right now, like regarding you know these people from the Capitol getting exposed uh, via video and by pictures, so. You know, even though there was all this footage from inside the Parkland shooting, all of these viral posts, you know, even though there's so much accessible, so much basically first person material accessible, you've got somebody who's in Congress who is writing laws um, saying that it didn't happen and saying that it was a false flag called upon by Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi. Um, and and at this point, you know, I, I, I try not to get too political about something that is so deeply, you know, asinine, but it's so embarrassing to be a Republican in office right now. And it's, uh, it's, it's so cringe. You know, I can't imagine what it would be like being a Republican in office right now. You've got 
Donald Trump refusing to accept the election results. You've got people storming the Capitol. And just the cherry on top right now is there's an elected official denying the Parkland shooting, which happened literally just about three years ago. So, you know, that's just what the party is now. And that's what all people in the Republican Party are standing for. And they'll be fine with it moving forward. Cameron, I think you're being, I think you're actually being a little unfair on that. Personally, I, to, you know, I, I, I think you're I think a little, little, but here's what I would say. It raises, but it's a, what I would say is this, no matter how st- it's word of time, I'll tell you what's really interesting to me in terms of this, in terms of your peer group, but also even my kids who are younger than you, is this is a time that people have really strongly held views. You have really strongly held views on this. People do. How do we as a society have a really good debate among young people? That's one of them. You know, you talk about organizing, but I think one of the most interesting things, too, that we try to figure out, Isha works on the whole education program. And you know what we've done in education at Common Sense when you when you intern there. One of the things is how do you have a civil discussion now? Right. One of the biggest things that I would tell you that we've really had to do is we built out the digital citizenship curriculum that Isha was talking about. Obviously, you talk about screen time. Obviously, you talk about the addiction stuff you're talking about. But the, one of the biggest things now is how do you have a civil discussion among adults and kids, particularly when people have such strong points of view. And when now you have the kind of amplification, if you will, that social you were referring to it in terms of the QAnon congresswoman. But. There's amplification of people on all different sides of the aisle. And one of the things that's so interesting now is how do you take, I think this is for par- parents, but it's for educators in our audience. And it is how do you have on he- really emotional, powerful topics and also at a fraught political time where we've just gone through a era of division and stuff like that. How do you have good, healthy civic discourse in class, at home, with your neighbors, you know, and on, on social media. I actually think that's a really, really important, one of the big issues, Isha, when you're talking about sort of digital citizenship and ethics, the kind of work we do daily, Cameron, you know, in schools and stuff. How do you have these conversations that people can talk to each other and listen to each other and not over-politicize it? I think that's a really, really important thing. Sure. Well, one of the issues I've seen recently, and you know what, a streamer, a video game streamer, Ninja, brought this up. And it was really, really powerful when he was talking about it was the power that anonymity gives people who are espousing hate speech. And, you know, all these different conspiracy theorists online, all these people who end up becoming violent and who end up adopting violent ideologies that they then enact in real life and that inform real life, you know, bad negative decisions. A lot of this comes from. A rabbit hole of YouTube content and, uh, and of streamers and of all these different people who are making content that simply bolsters and promotes hatred um, that's not only accessible to kids, but is also very interesting to watch. And, you know, uh, it, it's really bizarre. A lot of the pe- young people I see who end up falling into some really, really problematic mindsets and not only that, who end up having very, very, you know, who, who end up being very, very toxic and negative for the greater discourse, so to speak. Uh, it all comes from YouTube videos and streamers. And that really makes me think about what the role of the parent is in this situation. Uh, Ninja said that it's not his job to teach children how to behave online. Parents need to parent. That I, I'm, you know, I'm being a little reductive towards the, the longer message he had. But Parents don't know what their kids are doing and saying on Roblox or on Minecraft. And, and you know, it's you, you, you look at these things as video games, but they're social spaces now for, for so, young people. So, Fortnite so, is- I, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to interject. I, I really appreciate this, and I feel like it's a very rich conversation. I, I do want to, just from my digital citizenship hat, you know, yep. reiterate that We are a nonpartisan organization, and I feel like this type of phenomenon is, to your point, Jim, happening on both sides, and really the essence is how do we have a civil discourse around it? And I think it really is establishing that common ground. Um, And it's a bit for schools, our schools program. I agree. That's why I was saying it's interesting because I've known Cameron for forever and what a leader you've been, but you're strongly, you know, it's like, how do you have really good conversations at a time, it's by the way, it's a it's a national issue because, but it's yeah. really true among kids. But it's also a national issue, and the adults are setting the example. I actually think, Cameron, what you're saying that what you're mentioning, 
is absolutely uh, correct. And Ninja, for the audience who doesn't know who Ninja is, I didn't know who Ninja is, but my kids all know who Ninja is because he has an incredibly important figure in the gaming industry. And there are, and, and, and by the way, you're right. It's a big challenge, I think, for parents today. YouTube, Cameron, you're talking about all the YouTube videos. So obviously, Common Sense, we've had to learn that. But the app, I, as a parent, if I didn't work at Common Sense Media, I would not have any idea what my 12-year-old or 15-year-old was consuming on YouTube or TikTok or anything else. I would not. I think, you know, when we started Common Sense and you were trying to help parents with issues around, you know, which movies and TV shows to let their kids watch, you were still sitting in a room in front of a TV set or you could control, there was a video game machine, movies and TV and music. And you had way more, and it was hard, but you had way more control of the devices and the content that your kids were going to be exposed to. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges now is mo in those days, we would the TV we cared most about video was Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, and for little kids, also PBS Kids. Now, almost all the content that matters is streamers, social media platforms, YouTube, it's, and it's not some kid safe version of any of these things. And so I'm parenting right now, it's an incredibly difficult time. And we've had to change what Common Sense did in terms of the reviews we did, in terms of the curriculum that Isha and her colleagues in school do, because the media consumption and the tech consumption has changed so much. By the way, the tenor of the discussions as we were just talking about has changed so much as well. And it's just a hard time to be a media and tech parent in general. And then you add COVID-19 and everyone being cooped up inside. And I would say it is the, it is the moment for complicated tech parenting in a way and where everyone needs help and where uh, I'm glad we're here to do it, but parents in the audience should know they're not alone with, with the challenges or imagine a three-year-old and, and your baby, Isha, how you do <laughs> and your job. So it's amazing times on all this stuff. Yeah, I, I do just want to pivot because I feel like there's a lot of great questions coming in from the audience and I feel like I want to I wanna make sure we get to those. Yeah. Um, I think there's just really a lot of, of questions around media balance and addiction, especially as it relates to the time of this pandemic and everything that's going on. Um, one of the questions is, is any tips to effectively balance the desire for kids to be knowledgeable about technology while not falling prey to the damaging impact of unrealistic images and standards portrayed on many platforms? Boy, I I'd be interested in what you say about that, Cameron, too. I mean, the tips I think are you constantly have to talk with your kids about it. I mean, I think this stuff, by the way, it's changed though, because my kids are older. I mean, they're a little older than they're a little older than Cameron and down to 16. And the thing is, is I think now the you you really have to, I think you have to have an ongoing conversation with your kids about all of these issues and 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 be as honest as you possibly can with them and listen to them about what their experience is. I mean, Cameron, what do you think of that question? How would you answer that to a parent? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, uh, problematic uh, representations of people for children have always been a thing, right? I mean, I was, you know, if, if I were born in the 80s, I would be comparing myself to my He-Man action figures and wondering why I don't look like that. And, you know, same goes for, you know, just a lot of the things you see on TV, a lot of the things you read in comic books, whatever it is. You know, um, so on social media, you're going to get children comparing themselves to very, very unrealistic standards awesome. for what human beings should look like. I mean, every person I know edits their pictures on multiple apps before posting them on Instagram. So I think you just and, and I don't like to talk that much about parenting because every time I do, parents say, oh, you, you'll understand when you have a kid. And I'm like, I'm sure I will. You know, yeah. you asked. <laughs> but I'd say you just like you said, Jim, you need to be talking to your kids and you need to be parenting and you need to be making it clear that the internet is simultaneously not real and also one of the realest things you can be dealing with. And you have to you know, be able to realize, and this goes from everything from misinformation to Instagram pictures that set unrealistic body standards. You have to realize that what you're seeing online is not necessarily completely real. And I think that's a really good point. The one thing I would say as a parent is, Certainly, I've talked to all four of our kids about it, particularly our daughters. I, my, the last book I wrote, Talking Back to Facebook, I wrote an entire chapter about body image and Facebook and the incredibly negative impact. That was when Facebook was popular with teenagers. 
before Instagram took over and Facebook became for people in their 40s and 50s. And so um, I wrote a whole thing about the body image issue that Cam that your question leads to, but also that Cameron's talking about, because it's such a big deal as a parent. And that and it's true. The, the platforms are comparative by nature. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, when he started Facebook, first of all, he went to the same high school that I went to and my brother did and Andrew Yang did. And we had a thing called the Facebook, which is where he came up with the idea for the Facebook. But it was all about comparison. And it was always about who looks better, let's be honest. And that was what he started with at Harvard. It was really to check women out, essentially. And, and that's the original concept behind Facebook. So it's a comparative platform from the get-go in many ways, right? Google being a search platform with ads and Facebook basically being a comparison platform and reflecting a lot of the people who built that company, their values. But what that for a kid is really hard because as Cameron said, everybody photoshops their image, everybody is constantly tweaking their post. And it's not a it's very I thought what you said is interesting. So if you think about it on the level of a 12 year old to a 15 year old, it's in one way is totally unreal, but then in many ways it's totally real. I think that's actually a very good way to put it mm -hmm. for a kid for who's a, like a 14 year old. But it's, I think as a parent, you got to have those conversations. I've tried. It's not easy with teenagers, as people, parents of teenagers know, but you got to have them, I think. And school, you have to have them in school. I think you have to have this big part of this in the curriculum we teach too, Isha, because kids have to know that this is not perfect. People aren't all perfect. And, and, and that's so hard at the adolescent development age. So that's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I just want to interject that I think a, a big piece of this is as a parent really trying to have the conversations as Jim said but really ag agreeing that not all screens are equal and really it's not necessarily about the amount of intake that is happening but what are they using their screens for um, and we shouldn't lump online class time together or FaceTiming with friends uh, you know, and playing Roblox or watching TV with the same pieces of, you know, going down a rabbit hole of, you know, specific following specific types of people on social media that give you, you know, a bad image and impression of yourself and really, you know, all of those pieces. So it's really important to, to have the conversations as much as you can uh, to help support uh, children and in, into effective and meaningful tech use and screen time. Um, there was one question that just came in, it says, my daughter says that if they do have less time on their devices or no access to social media, they lose friends since it's such a norm to have these things now. Any thoughts? What do you think, big boy? You know better. <laughs> you know, I think um, I think it is important for your kids' mental health for you to take into consideration you know what the social climate is for them and and every and, and their peers. Uh, so you know I think that it is a bit misinformed to bar your kid from using social media completely, because the fact of the matter is it's going to be something that is going to be part of their life whether you like it or not. And you know it's you 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 can't you can't try and and hold your child back from that because again it's just the direction our society is going in and it's going to continue in that direction but on the other hand you know there it common sense does this so well it, it is important for there to be restrictions and you know a lot of the big tech companies are going to need to keep that in mind or else different alternatives are going to come out that are more appropriate for kids but i, I again i would say that you know it's true. I, w I wish, uh, you know, if I had children right now, I, the first, my initial thought would be get them off of social media. Don't let them get on Instagram. But suddenly, you know, they're alienated amongst their peers and you have to strike a balance. I think that's a really good answer. I agree. You know, it's interesting. I, I've come from found the day of the days of founding common sense to all of this through what we say as experts and people like you should know the expert advice better than I do now. Because um, I haven't written that, I haven't been part of that in a decade, but I, you think about it in your own self, right? With your own kids. And it's really, look, I, it's a great, all these questions are good questions. They're hard. And I tend to be more balanced. I actually like to, and I actually think right now in the pandemic, it is so hard on kids, right? The fact that they're not in school with their friends, the fact that kids are locked up at home, oftentimes I'm incredibly fortunate 
with where I live and stuff. And it, I don't enjoy this at all, but imagine so many people are in much, much more cramped conditions and parents are under stress because they're working and doing childcare and making sure their kids are in school and feeding them and everything else. And so I do think for kids who are not able to socialize with their friends, which is critical to growing up as a kid and, and adolescent social media is a huge factor in that. I think we have to, I think you're, th that question is fair from a kid and you have to sort of strike the right balance. So you don't want them doing it 24 seven, but I agree with Cameron a lot. And I look at it as a parent, you got to cut them a fair amount of slack right now. And in general, they socialize differently than we do. I do not socialize on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram at all. And I have a long history of not getting along with Facebook and Instagram anyway, but I, we do not, I don't, but my, my kids do, my kids do. And I would, so I'd really try to be sympathetic to their point of view and, and strike the right balance. It's a great, it's yeah. a great what parents feel, I know. I worry yeah. about it. Well. Uh, and just to, to interject with our own, like, you know, person like point of view from common sense it's just that it's absolutely okay to monitor and set guidelines for yeah. your children and, and acknowledge that we don't recommend social media for kids under 13 that's just purely a law and we really think that it's important to have you know draw boundaries have moments where there are you know device free times allow for you know other times where there are and just like practicing and modeling, you know, what it means to be a good, you know, digital citizenship and have proper media balance in your life. I think those are like modeling it as a parent uh, is going to be more, more, go far farther than anything else. I think number number one thing, Isha, I, mm -hmm. I actually agree. And uh, what you guys, uh, the tips are absolutely spot on. But I, if you actually, the one thing I think every parent has to remember is your own behavior is the single biggest impact on your kid. Do as I say, not as I do. I'm sorry, they do as you do. And and the older you get, the more you totally see that. And your kids come, by the way, when your kids get to be in their 20s, they know that too. And so mm -hmm. it is modeling it and it's hard, but, it, and it's hard during a pandemic. I mean, and that's stretched out this long and is gonna be, we're gonna be entering more than a year and all the other stresses and mental health challenges that adults face, let alone young people face. So yeah. the balance factor is key, but role modeling, and, and, and actually, I would say talking to your kids about what a tough time this is and how screen time limits might be a little different during COVID-19, because as you said, they're taking their classes. They're in front of the Zoom for four or five hours a day, sometimes in school, too. So really, really good. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, going from the addiction piece, I, I know parents are concerned about the idea of just, you know, what is the impact on mental health? Um, so yeah. just to kind of, you know, and your book definitely talks about this, just to dive into that realm. Uh, Cam, can you talk a bit about the concept of competition, how social media is driving a sense of competition among teens, thanks to the, you know, false reality that it can promote? Sure. Well, you know, uh, likes on social media release good, you know, positive chemicals into your body. And it's something that's addictive. And it's something that a lot of people I know are very emotionally attached to. I've learned how to emotionally detach from my social media engagement, but I think I just had to because my social media engagement was going down. So I figured I might as well uh, treat my social media a little bit like a, an intellectual toilet where really the only, only the worst things go on it. But um, you know, it's it's something that is used as a social credit, so you know, social media engagement. It's something that affects your your you know your corporeal life is you know what what it looks like online. So it, you know, it's not really about beating that beast anymore because that's a fight that we've all essentially lost. It's about learning how to integrate it into our, your life and also our greater culture and your parenting, just just about everything, as part of what's going on. Ultimately, you know, you you gain social points from having you know, the social media engagement that you want and social media engagement that's better than the people around you. But that's just competition in general. That's just meritocracy. <laughs> that's just, you know, what the social systems we all build. Hmm. Isha, let me yeah. ask you a question, Isha. Mm -hmm. so that is not true for my generation, Cameron, right? That is for you and for kids younger than you, for sure. Isha, for people in your age range, you think there's like, a fair amount of social media competition. I mean, do you think the way Cameron just described for like his peers and people, do you think, well, how about that too for people your your generation? 
I, does not affect me. I can assure yeah. you. <laughs> I, I think it, it in in my generation, it probably varies dramatically from person I mean, to person. And I think it maybe not to that extent, and partly because we didn't grow up, you know, we weren't digital natives in that sense. So I think there is some sort of shift, but I, I absolutely think the idea of FOMO and you know, wanting to make sure that you know, that dish that you ate is like the most amazing looking dish and you want to share with everyone. I think there's definitely pieces that probably subconsciously play into yeah. our minds that we don't even, you know, realize. I, I definitely think so. Yeah, well, I, I guess thinking about, you know, we've touched touched upon addiction and mental health. Um, and I, I really want to kind of put on the parent hat here for kids, parents who are like really trying to think through um, you know, device use with their their yeah. children, and also want to talk about you know the idea of data privacy. Um, that was like another piece that we've really talked about, and the success of big tech in many ways has been driven by their ability to to profit off of kids and teens' personal information. As you know, a digital citizenship you know person working on this curriculum, this is something we really want to instill with our youth. I'm just curious. Uh, you know, what is there, like, what is there for parents to really know in this space as it relates to, you know, data privacy and how they can protect their, you know, their children? First of all, the thing they should know is they should be very grateful to Common Sense Media for being the most important consumer privacy advocacy group in the United States uh, for the past five or 10 years. And for the work that we've done, not just on kids' privacy, but on your privacy, because we are the folks who conceived of and wrote and then spearheaded the passage of the California Consumer Privacy Law, which is the basically the law, national privacy law in the United States. Um, and we just also then were the co sponsor of the ballot in California this November that strengthened that law. And because there's no federal privacy law, the California law is essentially the consumer privacy law in the United States. And so I actually, in, as our audience and uh, users of Common Sense, I want you to know that that's who we are and that we are the biggest advocacy group in the country in that space and care about it because we represent you and your kids, but we represent basically all consumers in that. So that's number one is that, and because we've gone all that way to get the law passed and now it's enacted and you have tremendously new rights in California, but anywhere now in the United States, because the companies basically have to follow the California law everywhere. Um, that means that you need to know more about privacy and you need to be able to talk to your kids about it, but you now basically can keep much more of your personal data. and. Common Sense has a lot of basic information for you about how to protect your personal data, but now companies simply can no longer just hoover it up from you and, and without telling you or asking you to read a 90 page privacy policy at the end of an app that you're never gonna read, you're just gonna check the box. Um, so everything is changing because the law changed and it changed in Europe also with GDPR. Consumer privacy really matters and we have a ton of tips, but the number one thing to do is realize you now can control in most use cases your private information and it's incredibly important you that you do that and you're going to see it's going to become easier and easier for people to do that as a result of the law and then businesses will spring up but it's a big change isha and and yeah. it, it affects everybody it affects cameron it affects you it affects everybody in our audience and and that's important to know about because I, our basic rule that we say in digital citizen, you know, in, in your education stuff is protect your information, keep it private. And now the public gets that a lot more. And now you're much more protected under the law for that. Yeah, thank you. Super, super helpful. Um, just being mindful of time. And I feel like this is a really great meaty question. I'm curious. Uh, one of the questions that came in is predicting social media 10 years into the future. Where do you see social media in terms of how we will be using it and what the role it will play in our lives? Uh, I mean, it, it's impossible to say VR is going to be a thing. We're going to be meeting uh, in VR. We're going to be organizing in VR. We're going to be, you know, just, I mean, what I say whenever anybody asks about this is what did your iPhone look like 15 years ago? And what did, what, you know, I was I was a conscious person when when my mom had a BlackBerry, and I you know I wasn't old enough to have a phone, but I was playing with my mom's BlackBerry, and suddenly in very little time, you know, uh, we're we're here with with tech looking like this, so it's it's hard to say. All all we can really say is that 
it's hard to believe that it's not going to have fully encompassed our lives because if it, you know, if it hasn't already at this point, you know, what it's going to look like when Apple glasses become ubiquitous, uh, you know, it's, there, there's no telling. All I know is that every single thing in the world will have an advertisement on it. So I don't agree with Cameron. That's hilarious what you just said. That's interesting because I look at it very Let me tell you how I look well, at I'd it. I'd love to look at it. Please, please. But here's how I look at it because here's what I think. I think you're looking at it through the lens of your age, like, and like VR. That's interesting. I really wonder if VR really will get ubiquity, but VR, AR, that's one thing, right? And then AI, obviously, it, it, artificial intelligence will be really, really big. And, and I'm sure it'll impact how social media works. But I think the biggest thing is gonna, they're going to be regulated. If you really want to know the truth, I think that what's going to happen 10 years from now is that they're going to be treated like publishers and they're going to be Comcast or CBS or the Washington Post and the rules and restrictions. So I think so on, a, on sort of what I would call the news and information or misinformation, disinformation and all the hate speech and other stuff we're talking about earlier. I think they're going to be regulated 10 years from now. And I think we're going to have a cleaner and healthier tech media ecosphere. I think one of the hugest things that's happened in terms of the divisiveness in our country, and we've talked about it earlier in different ways, and it's a really important thing I think talk with our kids about and talk about in class, classrooms, et cetera, is that it's been amplified by social media platforms so much. So I actually think instead of talking about what the gadgets will look like, which Cameron is probably right about, they'll be phenomenal. I think it's going to be regulated and hopefully have a healthier impact in our lives. I would hope that we've also figured out a lot more positive uses of social media and that it and and that and that we're more mature in the way that it evolves. I mean, hey man, we're knocking down hedge funds now. Like, you know, the Reddit has become a more accurate yeah. financial indicator than the GDP. Literally, that's a real thing now is that if you want to know what's going on in our country, uh, Reddit will will tell you a little bit better than the GDP. So, you know, it's going to it's looking like there's going to be sweeping regulation. I mean, the Biden administration says that they're monitoring the, the what's going on with Reddit and what happened with GameStop. They said they've got an eye on it. And, you know, as for what that's going to mean for everybody, that that's just, you know, <laughs> up in the air. But, um, you know, it's it there's good reforms are coming and they're and they're gonna come swiftly so we'll have to see what that looks like that's true though isha i think and the audience even though people i think are asking more about what it's going to look like from a platform standpoint mm -hmm. hard to say because it'll be a bunch of engineers and product development people and they'll figure stuff out but and i don't know but i actually do think the biggest thing over the next decade is it'll get regulated and it'll mature and society i hope here's the deal which side of history? I'm curious. You want that part of the question is which side of history does social media want to end up on? And do you want it to be a more mature, responsible force in society, or do you basically want it to help have it continue to help undermine norms of democracy and institutions of democracy? Do you want to be at a place where people can crawl out from under rocks that they should sort of really go back and live under, who are who are inciting really, really, really horrific on all sides of the aisle? A, you know, challenges to a lot of important aspects. So I just think it's a really interesting time in that way, it's completely separate from what the platforms and the VR and everything else will look like. But I, it's going to be an interesting 10 years. It's going to be an interesting for the audience, 2021. This is going to be a big year politically. That I can hear. I don't know what the answers are going to be, but I can promise you there's going to be big stuff on the table. And our friends are going to be running the show in Washington on some of these issues, and that's going to be good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just one last piece I wanted to do before we start closing out, but Jim, what are you asking big tech to do to make things right for kids and teens? And what role can the federal and state government play in protecting kids and changing the tech landscape? So I think a couple of things. On big tech, what we're really doing is we do go to the most of the big companies um, on a frequent basis. I think we really ask them, depending on, it's first of all, they're not monolithic. You got to think about where they have the biggest opportunity. But in a more practical standpoint, companies like Google in particular, but Apple matters a lot here, Microsoft does too, and others can, is education. So they have a big role in K through 12 education. This is the companies themselves. And they also have a big role in terms of bridging the digital divide and the whole broadband revolution. That involves not just the several of the biggest tech companies, but also the cable and satellite providers like Comcast, AT&T, et cetera, Verizon. So in solving the digital divide for kids and education, the companies have a big thing. But I think, 
So that's, they need to do that and they need to do a lot more of that. And I think the biggest potential is revolutionizing education. And I think that the pandemic has given us a bunch of examples about distance learning and technology enabled learning that could be really, really important in transforming our K through 12 education system. But in a regulatory standpoint, we have four part agenda basically. One, starting with the digital divide, it's ridiculous that 15 or 16 million children in the United States don't have the same access to broadband connectivity and devices that the Steyer children do. And you were talking tonight about how much to limit devices. Well, there's millions of kids who don't even have devices and they don't have broadband connectivity and Wi-Fi at home. So they couldn't have participated tonight and they can't even go to class. So one of the biggest issues we're working on, and that really has to get solved at both the federal and state level. And a couple of my closest colleagues are now running this aspect of the United States government. You're gonna see, hopefully closing the digital divide and making really bringing equality and equity, equality of opportunity and equity to tech. So that's number one. I think you're gonna see major issues around what kind of, con how liable the platforms are for misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, violence on their platforms. The whole deplatforming of Donald Trump by Twitter, uh, YouTube, et cetera, Facebook, that's, that's a broad conversation that we're gonna resolve I would bet this year legislatively on around around an issue called Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. It's a federal legislation. If you're interested in it, come to Common Sense website or come to a policy briefing we do on it. But it's a big issue about how responsible YouTube, Twitter, and those guys are for the content of their platforms, Facebook in particular. Third is antitrust is going to be huge. There are going to be efforts to break up Facebook, Google, and other big companies, period. You're going to see that in the United States. You're going to see that in Europe, and it'll play out through primarily through state and US and global attorneys general. And that's gonna be a big issue you're gonna see. And last but not least, privacy. We talked about privacy earlier. You're gonna see big legislation to rein in tech around how much they can use your personal data. So it's gonna be a really interesting policy year, I think. And we could do another webinar, Isha, for folks at some point if people are interested in more arcane policy stuff, but it's gonna be a really important year and it'll affect everybody's life. These decisions will have a global impact and it'll affect, these may sound like big policies, but they'll affect everybody and how you interact with technology in your life. Great, thank you, Jim and Kim. Uh, believe it or not, we are out of time. Uh, so I just wanna thank you both for your extremely terrific insights and practical advice as we all strive to navigate technology through this stressful time. Um, I know there were a few other questions that were coming in and really what I gathered as a sense of all of them was just there's a lot of angst and feeling of, you know, what do I do as it relates to my kids and their tech use? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to like a few summarized points that I think might be helpful just is that one, like absolutely as a parent, draw boundaries, like that is your role, but also, you know, be flexible. We are in a pandemic. I feel like that those are two, you know, opposing pieces, but it's really important to acknowledge the world we're in right now and the stress and the mental, you know, toll that it takes on us as adults and, and on our children. Um, and so really just acknowledging that as it relates to like the privacy piece, it's really, you know, ensuring that you, kids know what is the difference between personal information and private information, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you use privacy settings, avoid location tracking. Um, these are all different things that, you know, I'm just right now blurting out to you because I want to just make sure you feel like you have something to go off of as you leave. But please do like take a look at the site. I know, you know, there's a lot of practical tips um, that we offer. And really, I just encourage you to kind of dig in a little bit deeper um, into the resources that are, being are shared, that are being shared, because I think, you know, there are, there's a lot that, of support that we can, you know, provide. Um, just wanted to thank you all for participating. We're so grateful that you took the time to join us for this Common Sense Conversation. If you were inspired to hear about the work uh, Common Sense is doing on our advocacy and education fronts, or if you appreciated the advice we shared tonight, we do encourage you to support our efforts by visiting our website at commonsensemedia.org backslash donate. Uh, as a nonprofit, of course, all contributions are tax deductible. Um, our goal is really to continue to keep our community of parents and educators informed about the important issues that impact kids' lives and to be your trusted guide on all of these issues relating to media and technology. 
Um, so again, I want to thank you, Jim and Cam, for your time. And I want to thank, thank all of you for attending. Uh, have a great night and stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Isha. you great, Isha. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank Isha, you. you are not great. <laughs>